Carolina's Field, Forest, and Water, a closer look at agriculture in South Carolina and conversations between the current and future leaders of agriculture in the Palmetto State and experts from across America. Presented by the students of the South Carolina Governor's School for Agriculture at John De La Howe. From our campus in McCormick County, here's our moderator, Asa Simmons. Welcome to this this edition of Carolina's Field, Forest, and Water. I am Asa Simmons. Our guest today is, is a professor at, at Clemson University. He, he is a historian and a recognized authority on Southern culture and history. He is also a, bu a bug guy. In fact, in the state of South Carolina, he is the bug guy. His official title is State, Anth oh my gosh. state Anthemologist, which, which makes him the, pa the Palmetto State's preeminent authority on insects. Welcome to our podcast, Dr. Tim Drake. Also, I just want to say this because I'm also a comic book fan. Did you know that, like, are you, do you know that you're, you also have, like, the same name as one of the Robins? That's what people have told me. I didn't know that until somebody told me that. Yeah. It's, I'm pretty sure it's, like, the third Robin. But, yeah, you have the same name, and that's what I keep thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question I do have was, you know, considering that, you know, um, the TV show and the game, The Last of Us, is based off of um, – a, a, a cordyceps that's known in like the real world to commonly uh, uh, in, infect insects. Do you think that could possibly, you know, could that could that travel from insects to animals to humans? I'm not familiar with that show. Oh well, basic basically, it's like a show that's actually based off a of real cordyceps that um it can it can infect the insect and basically like mind control them into going into high places or vulnerable places or warm places to be either. So they can grow or to be eaten to either to be able to like repopulate somewhere else. Most things that are naturally occurring in insects would not be transferable to humans in the way of habits or or genetics. Um, the one thing insects do do, though, however, uh, that affects humans negatively in a lot of cases is disease transmission. And so, you know, insects are capable of transmitting a variety, especially mosquitoes. Um, and some flies and other insects to humans, uh, diseases that can be very impactful to civilization. Um, you know, if you look at, insects are quite scary when you look at it from that standpoint. Mosquito, we wouldn't think about it, but the mosquito is the most dangerous creature on the face of the earth. Uh, and it has killed more humans in the history of the world in all wars and diseases combined uh, through malaria or yellow fever or other mosquito-borne diseases and still kills over a million people in Africa every year. Uh, so mosquito would be a, be a good science fiction creature to talk about. Well, considering we're on the topic of mosquitoes, like uh, um, what, what, what policies or things are you trying to do to prevent, like, be, to prevent like, mosquitoes being able to transmit the, those diseases? We have several mechanisms in place in South Carolina. We work real closely with um, DHEC, Department of Health and Environmental Control, uh, they're the authority over public health diseases in South Carolina. And so what I would do as the state entomologist and involved with pesticides, if, if we should have uh, an outbreak of disease in South Carolina like equi Eastern Equine Encephalitis, Triple E, uh, that's possibly the most dangerous mosquito-borne disease that we could ever get in South Carolina. Um, if you get Triple E and you're under 13 or over 60, there's going to be a funeral, basically. You're going to die. If you're between those ages, you're probably going to spend the rest of your life in a nursing home with severe debilitation. So if we should get something like an outbreak of, of Triple E, and it affects mainly horses, uh, but also gets in the human population, uh, we would petition for specific insecticides to be used against that. Um, and so Department of Health Environmental Control, DHEC, would actually coordinate the mosquito control, in other words, the aerial spraying of those uh, insecticides over certain areas. And um, so we would petition for specific pesticides to be used. Sometimes pesticides that aren't even used now uh, routinely in the United States could be brought back if we had some kind of a huge outbreak of a, of a disease uh, that was transmitted by an insect that would affect humans. So that's sort of how I would get involved in, in coordinating the, the use of that pesticide uh, with the public health agency in order to take care of mosquito populations. And this would occur like after a hurricane uh, or some, some severe, uh, some severe uh, climatic event that occurred uh, that would cause an increase in mosquito populations in the state. 
Uh, we do have pretty good mosquito control in most of the coastal areas of South Carolina now. So we do have diseases that are always a threat. We've got, um, you know, we have the threat of dengue, chikungunya, um, West Nile virus, a lot of things that are transmitted by mosquitoes. But we haven't seen that many outbreaks of that in South Carolina because we do have such a good mosquito control program in the coastal states or coastal counties of the state. Um, another question I have is like, considering that you know, most of the insects that you know kind of that, that kind of come that kind of come over here are like you either from like a Asia or Africa. Why do you think those those are the ones that mainly come over here, not European bugs? Or that's a good question. Um, because of our climate, South Carolina has a climate that's very akin to parts of Asia and parts of Africa. Um, and so a lot of the insects that are native to those areas, um, when they come here, they can thrive and do very well because the climate is very similar. And so most of our invasive pests that have come into the nation or into South Carolina and the southern states, um, both plant and insect invasives have come from, uh, a lot of them from China, Japan, uh, and the continent of Africa because the climate is so similar to those areas. And then when they get here, uh, one of the characteristics of an invasive species, it doesn't have a natural predator. So whereas that species may have some predator or some, something over there in the country it comes from that keeps it in check, when it gets here, it doesn't have that. And so what it does, it, it can damage agriculture, it can outcompete our native species, which can, like the Joro spider that we talked about at lunch. The Joro spider has come from Japan and it's something that is not really of harm to humans, although they do have big sticky webs, but it's out competing or they think it might out compete some of our native spiders and sort of throw the ecosystem into a, an unbalanced state. Because when you start eliminating your native species, uh, you have, have one invasive to move in and it may eliminate five, 10, 15 native species. And so that would really set your, uh, your ecosystem that's been balanced for, for millennia. Um, into sort of a state of unbalance. And so that's, that's one reason uh, invasives aren't good, uh, and also because of their negative impacts to agriculture. So many of them affect the plants that grow the food we eat, um, and they in, you know, infest crops, and so uh, they make the cost of producing crops much greater than they would have been. So, but the, to answer your question, the climate is very similar here and to parts of Asia and Africa from where these, these insects come. Well, uh, considering that I know that, you know, like, whenever a invasive species, like, comes here that I know, like, they have tried in the past to introduce a predator for it, like, would you possibly, like, try doing that in South Carolina, like, introducing, like, a bird or, or some type of, like, animal that would eat, like, you the Jaro spider? You have to be real careful. Um, that has been done successfully to some extent. Um, they tried it with fire ants. They had a forid fly, which is a little fly that actually will lay eggs in a fire ant's head capsule, and then when those eggs hatch, the head capsule pops off, it kills the fire ant. Um, the problem is those don't survive as well as the invasive pest does. We've also had instances where things like what's called the kudzu bug now, the bean platyspid, was introduced to, um, in an experimental situation, to control kudzu. Uh, those came from, from China. The problem is that those things um, also eat soybeans and agricultural crops. So you've got to be real careful when you introduce something to control a pest to make sure that won't become an invasive species in itself. What are some um, what are some regulations or things you're trying to push for to kind of like better help better help us become more resistant towards invasive species? Well, we've got several state laws and regulations as well as federal regulations in the USDA that control um, importation of commodities and goods from overseas. Um, a lot of things, inspections take place at the ports of South Carolina to help keep some of these invasive species out and those are all, all laws, those are federal laws. Uh, state laws we have mainly deal with the uh, interstate commerce of plants within the United States rather than overseas. We have things like phytosanitary certificates that have to be issued when you have plant shipments going out of the state of South Carolina to certain states uh, that don't have nematodes and some of the things we have to ensure that we're not sending pests to other states. And then other states have the same things that South Carolina requires. Um, basically, it's paperwork that clears those plants and those commodities to come into the state saying it's free of these pests. And that's not always fail safe because one of the biggest problems with invasive species is that people bring them in, people who move around. 
Uh, they bring their firewood, they bring their campers, they bring their uh, household goods when they move here from other places. Um, and so we've got things like the Asian longhorn beetle in Charleston. We've got about an 80, uh, 80 square mile quarantine right now in Charleston County because some people brought firewood in from Ohio. Uh, and they were just campers that came in and we didn't know that this was going on. So even though you have laws and regulations in place, there are always ways that people can get around those. Um, so, and you can only strengthen regulations to a certain point without affecting commerce. And so we're kind of in a delicate position where we want to have regulations that keep out these pests that could be dam damaging to the state, but we don't want to um, impede the ability of people and businesses do, to do commerce. Uh, so if you've got agricultural commodities that you want to move into South Carolina from another state, we want to make sure those are free of pests, but we don't want to be so stringent that we prevent that commodity from being sent in and used by the people. So it's kind of a, a fine balance between what you let in and what you don't, the laws you pass and the laws you don't pass. Uh, we have situations right now where cities and towns uh, in the low country are trying to pass laws within those towns to eliminate the use of pesticides. But we have in South Carolina what's called preemption, which means that we as a regulatory agency at Clemson have sole authority over pesticide regulation. So a town or a municipality cannot legally impose uh, stricter regulations within that town that we don't sanction. So there, and that's for reasons too of commerce and, and other things uh, that aren't, it's not really necessary to put laws in place. So you, you have to put laws in place, but you don't want to have too many laws in place that it impedes normal activities of people and commerce. Well, considering that, you know, I feel like you get into this job because for your love of, you know, bugs and stuff like that, but considering that this job, that your job can become a little bit political, do you, do you, do you see that side as somewhat like, do you not like that, that part of it or do you? I like that part. It actually becomes very political. Um, I do a lot of work in Washington, D.C. with the U.S. EPA um, and the Environmental Protection Agency is there to protect the environment from uh, the misuse of pesticides and chemicals and, and deal with chemical pollution. But in later years, uh, in recent years, the EPA um, has taken a stance, it's almost an anti-pesticide stance. So part of my job is to keep pesticides available for farmers to use because um, in agriculture, in large-scale uh, large agriculture, in the southeast where we do have invasive species, plants and insects that they don't have in other parts of the country, uh, we see that sometimes states out in the west coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and in the northeast states, try to impose regulations that would limit certain pesticides from being able to be used uh, in agriculture. They don't have the invasive species and pests that we deal with. So part of my job is to go to Washington along with regional people in what's called Region 4, that is eight southeastern states, and try to lobby to keep these pesticides um, out there for our farmers to use. Uh, and to actually have good labels on those pesticides that are enforceable. Uh, and an enforceable label is something that if a farmer or a person applying that pesticides, and farmers don't usually violate labels, it's usually going to be individual homeowners or businesses, uh, pest control businesses and such. So if they violate a label, then we have some kind of action that we can uh, enforce. In other words, we can take their license away, we can fine them, uh, and that allows that pesticide to be used. And so. I do enjoy the more political end of things because I do get to go up and lobby on behalf of the farmers of South Carolina to keep products that they really need to grow their crops. Well, when when I went on a, a field trip with my school, we did visit this one farm, and this one and and this farm views molasses to as as kind of as, instead of pesticides because like the like the the, the the sugar content would go into the plants and it would be too high for the insects to want to eat it do you possibly see like be see that becoming popular or there there are a lot of organic mechan or organic types of controls that people are using now but of course that molasses would have been a pesticide so you know that's a big misconception is that um Pesticides are only those things that you buy in a container at the store and that are labeled by the EPA. But anything that's used to control or mitigate a pest is a pesticide. So basically, uh, dishwashing liquid in water can be a pesticide. And so we have what are called um, uh, registered pesticides and unregistered pesticides. So the registered pesticide is something where the chemicals have been tested by a corporation and by the EPA and deemed safe to use uh, on, um, on plants and other things at the rate that they've been recommended. Uh, but people also have their own home concocted pesticides. And sometimes those are fine, 
but sometimes they're not real great. So the molasses to me wouldn't really cause any harm because that's something that, that is, is naturally occurring. It's, it's a, an agricultural product and it's something we consume. Uh, so if they were using molasses, um, you know, they may be having some efficacy with that. It may be actually effective against what they're trying to control. In most cases, those things don't really work that well. Um, and so um, you're still going to have some degree of insect damage on the plant that you wouldn't have if you used a conventional pesticide as it was recommended. But, you know, there are people who really um, want those products that are produced, what they call now organically, um, which is ironic because most of our pesticides are actually organic chemicals. Um, and so the, the organic agriculture to me um, uses a lot of inorganic chemicals. And we can get into the chemical basis of this. I won't. But um, uh, things like molasses and these more natural it's seen products can work, but it's not really as effective on large-scale agriculture. So in other words, the molasses could be used on maybe an acre or two, but if you're trying to farm three or 4,000 acres of tomatoes or something, that wouldn't really be that economically feasible. So um, those could be effective um, in, in small-scale farming, but it will always take conventional pesticides to control insects and pests uh, in large-scale agriculture that's required to feed most people. Uh, because, you know, you, a lot of this organic produce is, is great, but um, it's utilized by people who are fairly wealthy. Um, you know, someone who is not real wealthy can't afford most of your organic produce because it's so expensive to produce. Whereas your large-scale agriculture that produces lots of, lots of commodities by use of pesticide is typically cheaper. Uh, and so my position is uh, organic production is great, but it's not going to feed the world. You know, if you want to do that in your home garden, that's great. But a farmer can't go out there and produce economically enough food to feed a lot of people uh, in an organic matter um, over a pesticide usage matter, uh, conventional pesticides, um, and make those products cost effective for most of the market. In other words, you know, you go into the grocery store and these organically produced uh, green beans are like $6 a pound, whereas your conventionally produced green beans are like $2 a pound. And so that's always going to be there. Well, I know how they can, like, you know, genetically modify plants to make them more, like, mm -hmm. less, less drought-resistant and stuff like that. Could, like, is it possible that they do that to make, that make them more, like, resistant to get against insects or make them, like, more undesirable against certain insects and stuff like that? Absolutely, and that's what they're doing now. Your genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, have gotten a real bad rap in the press. But we've always modified, everything we eat is modified. Everything we eat now has been genetically modified over the last thousands of years. Uh, corn used to be about as big as wheat, and now it's large because it's been genetically modified. Uh, the issue with modern GMOs is they actually transplant uh, genetic material from one organism into a different organism. And so that's caused some controversy. But yes, there are ways that you can genetically modify certain plants to make them more resistant to insects. Uh, the most common genetically modified organism that we have in South Carolina is what's called uh, Roundup Ready and, and Dicamba Ready cotton and soybeans and some of these larger crops. And they've actually implanted genetic uh, material into these plants that make them resistant to herbicides. And so you can overspray these crops with herbicides and kill the weeds and not kill the crops. Uh, so there's been a lot of controversy over that because people thinking, you know, you might have uh, something that would, there are a lot of people who are allergic to peanuts. And they say, well, you might have some gene from a peanut that's been implanted in something else. And so you may get cross allergies uh, or cross allergic reactions to these things. So there's been a lot of debate over whether we should allow that or whether it's good or whether it's bad. Uh, but the reality is, yes, you can genetically modify organisms uh, to be resistant to insect damage. Um, but in that genetic modification, you also have to be careful. That you're, not, you're not losing your uh, ancestral strains of plants uh, because the ancestral strains are usually more suited to a specific climate, a uh, certain type of agriculture, uh, and then you keep modifying this and you modify it so far from the original that you've lost some of your original uh, resistance. Like, for instance, tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes uh, used to be poisonous. They were basically, they're in the nightshade family. And so we've genetically modified tomatoes to be edible by humans, but in doing that, we've modified some of their insect resistant qualities out of them. So very few insects will actually feed on nightshade, but they will eat tomatoes. So you can also go the other direction and make things more susceptible to insect damage 
because you're making them more palatable to humans. Well, considering that you long said, answer for a short question. <laughs> well, considering that you said how like um, how you, how you can modif- how, how you can modify plant to so you can spray more pesticides or herbicides, couldn't that possibly d- be dam- be like damaging towards the people who eat possibly like those vegetables like that are over sprayed, like not with the chemicals they're using. Um, Dicamba is the big one that's being used now to kill what we call red root pigweed or palmer amaranth that's, that's just really out of control. You can't grow cotton or soybeans or anything right now unless you use something to kill that plant in the crops. Um, there are what are called tolerance levels for all pesticides. And so these tolerance levels are derived through tremendous amounts of research by both the uh, registrants, the chemical producers, and by the EPA. And so what happens is when you spray this herbicide on a crop, most herbicides and insecticides are, uh, that are used in agriculture are degraded by sunlight, rain, and weather. So uh, they, are, they undergo photo degradation or some other kind of degradation. So there's what's called a, uh, there's a limitation on the time you can harvest after you spray this. So in other words, if it's a something that says you have to spray it on there and wait 30 days to harvest, you have to do that. Now, if you harvest before that date, then you can actually have residues that are higher than would be allowable in, in human food. Uh, So as long as farmers and and growers and people who spray pesticides observe label language and observe what the label tells them to do, everything is is completely safe for human consumption, um, as far as we know. We really have the safest food in this nation of any country in the world uh, because of such governmental controls over uh, over pesticide use and and labels. Um, But yeah, if, if you spray something on a food crop that's not meant for that food crop, um, you can get into trouble uh, because you can have, and the biggest thing is going to be your acute toxicity. Toxicity actually will, like especially in children because they're real sensitive, um, that could hurt a child or something. But that rarely, if ever, occurs. If it's found out that someone is sprayed uh, at a level that's not allowed by the label, that crop has to undergo what's called crop destruct. So they will go out and they will actually destroy that entire field of crop and not let it be harvested. Uh, so there, there are governmental protections in, in place that protect people from um, overuse or higher levels of insecticide or herbicide being put on something that than it's supposed to be. Um, did that sort of answer? Yeah. Uh, another question I have is like, uh, what's your, well, what would you say is like currently the most controversial bug? The most controversial <laughs> bug. Well, the one that's that's really causing the most problems now is the bed bug. Oh um, yeah. And, but, basically, basically, um, France has like is infested with bed bugs, mm-hmm. and because that happened around Paris Fashion Week, people who who went who went oh, there for Paris, France. yeah. So then, like, they're taking it out. So mm-hmm. like, that's kind of a big thing because now there's probably bed bugs everywhere. And the reason <laughs> we have bed bugs now in such large numbers is because the EPA outlawed specific pesticides that were being used for bed bugs. Uh, there was a very effective peg bu- uh, pesticide called clopyrifos, and Dursban was used in homes. And Dursban happens to be what's called an organophosphate insecticide. And organophosphates or uh, nerve poisons. Uh, and at the levels they were used, they caused no human harm whatsoever. But EPA has what's called a risk cup analysis. So all organophosphate pesticides go into that risk cup, and if you exceed that risk cup, you have to take uses out. So the the company that made Dursban uh, for use in houses uh, found that they were getting more money from their agricultural uses of that product than their interior home uses of that product. So the company itself eliminated all home uses of Dursban. Well, Dursban was very effective against bed bugs. And so when that was taken out of the ability of, of home pest control services to use Dursban in homes, uh, you started to see in the resurgence of bed bug populations. We also had a lot of people migrating into this country from other places that had uh, tremendous bed bug populations, and they would bring their clothing and things with them. And so we've had so many bed bugs brought in, starting in the larger cities in the United States, New York City, Chicago, Atlanta, a lot of the big cities uh, started getting bed bugs about 15 years ago when they outlawed Dursban. And so that problem is just exacerbated, and it's especially bad um, in the homes of poor people, in the homes, uh, in nursing homes, in care facilities and hospitals and places because um, once a bed bug infestation gets established, it's really hard to get rid of. And now with the lack of that Dursban to use, treatments are extremely expensive. So 
if you're someone who is not a very wealthy person and you get bed bugs, it's extremely expensive to get rid of them and you can't afford to get rid of them. Uh, and so that is a real, it's become a social issue almost uh, because you have certain levels of people who can afford to pay pest control companies to get rid of bed bugs and you have certain people who can't afford those control services. Um, and so it's, it's become a real unequal thing now when people have bed bug infestations. But it's, it's all because they uh, did away with the use of that certain pesticide. So that's an instance where doing away with the pesticide is actually more harmful to the human population than beneficial because bed bugs do cause so many problems in people's homes, especially people who are bedridden, elderly people who can't get out of bed. Uh, it's just a horrible, I've gone into houses uh, and have seen situations where uh, the bed bugs are crawling on the walls, they're all over the people, they're all over the bed, um, and you just, you walk in and they immediately are crawling on you. We also have a situation in chicken houses now, in uh, poultry houses in South Carolina and Georgia, where they've had such a resurgence and bed bugs will actually feed on chickens, uh, had such a resurgence in bed bugs because of the lack of the, the use of Durspan that you can't even get people to work in the chicken houses anymore because the workers go in there and the bed bugs cover them up. Uh, and so there, that's, that's a huge problem and it's, a, it's, a, it's also a social problem and a very controversial social problem because your socioeconomic class has a lot to do with whether you can afford to control bed bugs or you can't. Well, say, well seeing that you said how like, you know, like economic class can, you know, determine whether or not you can you can get proper pesticides or treatments for, for, for certain type of insects. How do you see that can be prevented or changed towards where it can be beneficial to everyone and not just those who are, who are able to afford it? The only thing that can happen is that we can go back to, you know, the use of insecticides that are very efficacious against bed bugs. I mean, right now they have to do heat treatments uh, they have to use insecticides where the residual activity is very, very low. In other words, with the DERS bands and some of the organophosphates, you could spray an area and that residual activity would be there for six months. And so bed bugs require a long contact period with insecticide. Now they use what are called pyrethrins, synthetic pyrethroids. They have residual activity of sometimes maybe up to a week and then they're gone, which is safer for humans, they think. But if you've got a situation where you've got something like bed bugs, um, you know, if you were a poorer person, you could afford one treatment with Durzban that would eliminate your bed bugs. You can't afford 10 or 15 treatments with chlorpyrifos at the same price that's going to maybe or maybe not control those bed bugs. So what happens is you've got people going out and trying to self-treat. They buy these things at Walmart um, and other, th other insecticides that just aren't really good. And so, um, you know, I guess the solution would be to register pesticides that are very effective against bed bugs and are low cost uh, for a pest control company to come in and use in a, a housing project or somewhere like that where people just can't afford to have the control. Uh, but it's all making these products available at a reasonable cost to the public um, and still having them relatively low risk. So there's no real good solution. But we're, we're working on it. We're trying to work on it at a federal level. Those of us in state government are trying to pressure uh, some of these federal and state agencies and our federal agencies and registrants into registering products that are low cost, that will be effective. Um, and I could get into the rodenticide thing. I'm not going to, but that's going to cause tremendous problems in the homes of the poor now that certain rodenticides have been outlawed and that they control rats and mice. Well, what's, what's your favorite bug? My favorite <laughs> bug, um, and my favorite insect is probably the praying mantis, the Carolina mantid, which is our state insect. They're amazing little insects. And you know the difference between a bug and an insect, don't you? Yes. Okay. All bugs are insects, but all insects <laughs> aren't bugs. So bugs are a specific classification of insects. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, praying mantis would be an insect, and that's my favorite, my favorite insect, I think, because they're just, they're almost human in their, their movements and their activities. Um, I wouldn't say how they eat their, their spouse's head, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as a, as a female, you should like that. <laughs> it's the females that eat the males. You know, if you're a little male praying mantis, you gotta be really careful, <laughs> just like with spiders. You don't wanna be a male spider, you don't last very long. <laughs> Well, um, what's yours, Lily? What's your favorite, favorite bug? My favorite bug? Mm -hmm. um, well, I like ladybugs, but I know they're kind of 
<laughs> kind of eat everything. So. No, those are actually one of our best beneficials. Um, the <clears throat> the larvae of lady beetles are one of the best biological control insects because they eat lots of aphids. They're really great in agriculture. Now, the Asian lady beetle, which was brought in to control pecan aphids in certain areas, becomes invasive. They were the ones that come in doors in the wintertime, and you have them all over the walls. So that's probably where the confusion is. Yeah, that's the, but, but, you know, they're not a native species, uh, and they overwinter as adults rather than eggs, so they caused a problem. But our native species of lady beetle are wonderful. And those actually are good. They're good predators, just like the other lady beetles. But they can become a nuisance in the wintertime. So do the different colors mean different things? Because I've always been told the red ones are um, boys in the... No, uh, they, ones they don't. Girls. No, the colors don't don't have anything to do with the sex. Uh, it, they're different species of lady beetle. We have we have many different species of what we call lady beetles in South mm -hmm. Carolina. Um, so that would just be a different species, and the number of spots and all that are, are different on different species. Okay. Hmm. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I mean, I knew I knew that there was like the I know because like I heard that the ladybugs were. Were like in, in, instinct, and it was the and it was like the Asian ones that took over. I was like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Just the the Asian lady beetle has outcompeted our native lady beetles in some instances. We still do have a lot of uh, native species out there. It's just that you see the Asian ones more because of the ones that move in your house in the wintertime and cause so many problems. The yellow spots on the walls, they smell bad, uh, and actually they can cause skin irritation uh, if they get in, especially on your face or in your eyes. Mm. Yeah, I think we have a problem with that here at the school. When it gets cold, they'll mm -hmm. start all coming into the house. Probably so. stink bugs, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the brown marmorated stink bug is another invasive that comes in. Um, it was it came over from China, and they overwinter as adults as well. So they And that's the problem with these, these home invaders in the wintertime is our native species overwinter as either le eggs mm -hmm. or pupae or nymphs or something like that outdoors. Whereas these uh, uh, overwinter as adults and have to move inside to survive the winter. Mm. That's crazy, because here we spray every every single day, almost every single day. Because mm -hmm. like there's so, it's like I'm okay with the spiders, but like I'm not okay with the spiders. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the best way to control these lady beetles and stink bugs in your house is to get like a big um, a big plastic cup from McDonald's or Hardee's or one of these restaurants that's disposable and put you about, about a cup of water in there along with about a teaspoon full of Dawn dishwashing liquid. It's got to be Dawn. Mix it up, and then you can go just put that cup under that stink bug or that lady beetle, and it'll jump off in it. It'll kill it immediately. And you can do that and collect a couple hundred of them, pour them out, and that's the best way to catch them indoors once you see them is put that cup under there. They're going to fall in that water. And it kills them immediately, and it's completely safe. That's crazy. I might have to try that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, like uh, uh, when I was younger, my favorite bug was ant because uh, they're because the society. It's like it's like it's a giant society. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> and there are there are ecologists who have studied social structure of ant colonies and hymenoptera, which are the bees and the ants and the wasps and things. They have the most highly organized social structure uh, of any insects in the insect world. And so they're really fascinating. And ants fall right in there with the bees and the wasps. I think it's crazy because ants, they'll, like, if they don't like their queen, they'll just push her out. And then, like, I remember one time I was watching this, this TV show, and it was talking about how, like, these certain ants, I think they're in Africa, how they could fly. And I, and I, I was so scared because mm -hmm. I thought they were here. So then, so, 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 so then, like, if like if they don't like their queen, then they'll go searching for another one. And like the way you could tell it was a queen was because it could fly, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and and that and that that really scared me because I was just like I, I mean I liked ants, but I don't like it that much. Our reproductive ants here can fly as well. Um, you don't see them as much. And you know, the interesting thing about ants is is you can actually tell what family an ant is in, for Miss D or some of the others, by biting the head capsule, and it has a different flavor. Um, because why would the, you level, do that? the level of formic acid. <laughs> you, why would you do that? How did you figure See, that out? See, entomologists are just weird. Yeah, they're just <laughs> weird. But you can pick an ant up and you can bite its head capsule, and because of the flavor, the level of formic acid within that ant, you can tell almost what family it, it goes to. Um, Does it taste good? They don't taste good. They, they <laughs> taste sort of sour, almost like a, um, I don't know, a Sour Patch Kid or something. Oh you know, my one of those, God. They, they taste one of those sour gummy worms. <laughs> 
that's. <laughs> but the name Formicidae for the largest family of ants comes from formic acid, and all ants have formic acid in them at different levels. That's weird. That's that's kind of weird. <laughs> and, you know, ants used to be used uh, in ancient times the larger ants as sutures. So if somebody had surgery, they would take an ant and they would let it bite that, that place, word. and they'd pinch the head off, and the head would stay there keeping that wound closed. But it didn't get like infected or nothing. Mm-hmm. I knew about that hurt. one. I also, I also know how. Like, what if you're allergic? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're allergic to the sting. So it, it basically what you're allergic to in bees and wasps and ants is the sting. It's the protein and the and the venom that you're allergic to. Uh. So the the bite wouldn't hurt you. It would be the sting that would cause an allergic reaction. Oh, I got you. Wait, ants they sting? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fire ants do. We have several species, <laughs> native and imported species, that will sting in South Carolina. Oh, they just bit. Nope, they will sting. Now, a fire ant will bite you and sting you at the same time because they hold on to you and then they sting you oh, while they're biting you. that's why they, like, curl up mm-hmm. in a little Exactly. Ball. I hate them. And that's another non-native species that moved in here from South America. They can go back to South America. <laughs> <laughs> just personal opinion. Well, thank you to Dr. Tim Drake, state anthropologist for, for South Carolina, and thank you for, and, and thank you for tuning in to this edition of Carolina's Field, Forest, and Water. I'm Asa Simmons, and our, <laughs> our, 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 our co-host, Lily Fox. <laughs> uh, <laughs> join, us, join, us, join us next week for another conversation about agriculture here at the Governor's School for Agriculture at John Delahoe. Carolina's Field, Forest, and Water. A closer look at agriculture in South Carolina and conversations between the current and future leaders of agriculture in the Palmetto State and experts from across America. Presented by the students of the South Carolina Governor's School for Agriculture at John De La Howe. For more information on the South Carolina Governor's School for Agriculture, visit our website at delahowe.sc.gov.